So one thing I want to just remind everybody, of course, is to pray about the second hurricane to hit Florida and what's going on there. There's a lot of speculation about a lot of things. Uh, I know it hit Category four, 5 last night. Uh, and they're looking for it to go right across the center of the state, and then they said they don't know from there it might change direction. So be praying about that and praying about Israel. Again, Israel getting bombarded with rockets uh, as we pray for them. And, of course, so many of us have been there and walked in the land and ministered to people and uh, been more than one time and so on. Uh, it's a part of what we do, and we know it's the roots of our salvation, uh, what the Bible tells us, that our salvation is of the Jews. And as many people don't really want to hear that, and a lot of folks in the church now are being moved by this mass bombardment of media, uh, which reminds me what I talked about with one of the young groups is about, uh, we talked about the sower or the farmer who planted good seed and then the enemy who came in and planted bad seed or evil seed. And I said about all the things that God has established, the enemy is always trying to plant things in people's minds to go against that. Uh, and I had some good response over at the high school earlier. So uh, you think about how many things and uh, the media continues to sort of push and then you've got organizations pushing. Uh, you've got groups saying this is impossible, this is impossible. How many of you, you know about that thing in Springfield, Ohio? They said that people were eating the cats. Well, I listened to some Haitian fellas who said we all eat cats back in Haiti. They don't eat dogs, but they eat cats. So now we're looking at, well, how could it not possibly be true to some extent? So. Uh, you look at all these things, but uh, because of agendas and goals, people push things. So I talked to the young people today about the media, and it could be marketing. It doesn't mean the news, but marketing. They're always planning something in your head because if you have this, you'll be better. If you're doing this, you're going to be successful. And if we get you to follow along with this, and if you buy our item, or our, our success plan, you're going to be rich. And so they're always planning things in your minds. A picture. How many of you remember when we were younger and they finally said they flashed the thing of popcorn on the screen in the middle of the commercials and everybody got up and got popcorn? Uh, yeah. They should have. Now we should have them flash a picture of a gym. <laughs> we all get up and go to the gym for the first time ever anyway so with all of this and praying for people and you know Solomon said about with wisdom comes anguish or grief because when you really know what's going on in things and can see beyond just the human side of everything uh, you realize there's a lot people don't understand uh, Last night, one of the young fellows told me he could probably help me with a question I had in my Bible, uh, which was kind of funny. I didn't want to say anything after that, but he's been reading his Bible, I think he said, for three months. And I said, hey, man, I've been reading my Bible for 50 years. I, you know, I'm not talking about the kind of questions like, did, did Cain have on sandals when he killed Abel? I'm talking about questions about, Lord, how are people going to be? How are things going to fare in this? How's the church going to fare with what we're seeing happen right now and the changes in things? So, yeah, I've been shown mercy plenty of times in my life, so I was merciful. I didn't really respond to that. Uh, and I appreciated the young guy reading his Bible and so on. So tonight, let's go to uh, Corinthians. Um, I guess maybe while you're doing that, I don't know if any of you remember this. I had these, some of these that everybody liked and some people oh, yeah. bought them and so on. I just tried to recoup what we had in them. This is the last can. And I went online to see if I could find these anywhere else. I can find all kinds of other items that are similar, but nothing like this can. 
So none of you can have this <laughs> because it's more valuable now. As far as I know, unless you go southeast or southwest U.S., it may be a collectible. But you know what? How many of you are there? Just one, right? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about our value in the eyes of the Lord, and this one is different than all the other cans I looked at because it had different ingredients in there. It's got chorizo, if that's how you say that, jalapeno pepper, and cilantro. And so everything else I looked at didn't have the same, the same ingredients. And so what would that be, our makeup? Right. You know, not makeup that you put on, but our makeup, how we're built, how we're constructed. And so this one is different than all the other ones I found. Now the other ones you found, I found you could buy them for like a dollar ninety eight, I think it was. This was about two forty nine, which is not a lot of money. But now that it's the only one in Northeast Ohio, <laughs> if somebody really wanted this, they'd pay five or six times that to get it. So our lives in the presence of the Lord, how valuable that is, and nobody else has all the ingredients that you have. I mean, I know we're all made of the chemicals and min I mean, the minerals of the earth and so on, but in different proportions, different mindset, different heart toward God, a little more faith, a little less faith, uh, a little more trust, a little less trust, more praise, less praise. We're all different in the eyes of the Lord in that sense. And that's what makes us sort of more valuable, more important in the Lord. Doesn't mean we go around boasting that there's nobody else like me, because uh, then all of a sudden you run into somebody that looks a lot like you, but their personality is not the same. They could have facial expressions and features and everything else, but when you start talking to them, uh, it's like a lot of guys will say, and maybe some of you girls would say about guys you've run into, you know, you thought when you walked up to them, they were gonna be very nice, and they turn around and start cussing and swearing, or one thing I always hated even before I knew the Lord when I was a teenager was uh, girls that smoked. I mean, I didn't hate them, I hated the fact that, oh, gee, she smokes. Uh, you know, you didn't want to be around that much. So I hope none of you smoke. <laughs> if you do, there's forgiveness. And I don't think it'll keep you from the kingdom, uh, but you don't want to destroy your body, of course. So in uh, Corinthians, remember the church at Corinth, we, we call them, we say they were a carnal people. Uh, Paul talks about them, uh, that he couldn't talk to them like he could or should because you're carnal, you're still in your flesh, your old ways, sort of, and so on. But if you just look at how he addressed them in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 2, he says, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, we would say if he wrote us a letter here today, it would say to the church at Warren in Cortland, um, but it says unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified, we talked about Sunday, we laid hands on people and prayed for people uh, to be sanctified. And maybe we've done that before, but it's a reminder of what we, we are set apart for, what God's ordained us for, that we're not of the world, we're not like the world. Uh, he talks about later here in the scripture about the wisdom of the world, and the wisdom of the world is not to be what we're walking in, okay? He says, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, how are we sanctified? Because Christ dwells in our hearts by faith, because we've put on the Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. We're sanctified, those who are sanctified in Christ called to be saints. So many times you hear me say this, that I'm around folks that say, well, we're all sinners. We're all sinners. I'm still just a sinner. Well, you're called to be a saint. So I would start saying, no, I'm walking in the right standing of the Lord. I'm walking in the righteousness of Christ instead of saying I'm a sinner all the time. But somehow we think that's going to relate to people more. And I've watched people that have said that and people have sort of just trampled them with it. Well, then why would I want to be a saved person if you're a sinner? You're just like me. 
Well, and then you have to explain it all, and then they still don't get it. So we've been called to be saints. He says to them that are called, which means like Jesus said, you know, I've called you. God said that to Israel in the past. So them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, and he is our sanctification. We don't sanctify ourselves. Although now that he's working in our lives, we can set ourselves, as we talked about, apart from some things that we need to abstain from. Uh, called to be saints with all them, or with all that in every place, call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. So he's saying, you are saints, you are called, along with all of them in every place, basically who praise and worship and serve the Lord. And so as he's writing this to the Corinthians and the church at Corinth, he's really writing it for all of us everywhere who will now walk with the Lord and follow the Lord and serve him. And he says, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you. Again, I talked a little bit ago about these are letters that are being written. These are men that are uh, verbally conveying maybe what they pray for the church, for the people, that you'll have peace, that God will bless you, that you'll be sanctified, that you'll walk as saints, and so on. And so we take all of this to heart in the sense of it's here for us. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I thank God, or my God, always on your behalf uh, for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. And as much as we might look at people in the congregations, in the church, uh, see them stumbling around in their relationships and their walk, see that they're not really growing very much or they're not really applying. Paul's saying, I pray that uh, the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus, will manifest in you. And remember, the Bible tells us that grace teaches us that we should abstain from ungodliness. It's not just a uh, atmosphere out here, grace. It's teaching us all the time. We need to abstain from all of this so that we can serve and follow the Lord. So I thank God uh, always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. And what do we remember there? It's grace that brought us to salvation. It's grace that freed us from our sin. It's grace that's working in our lives to clean us up, right? So to thank God for the grace that's in somebody's life is to say no matter what it looks like they're living in right now, you've shown your grace and your grace is greater than sin, so your grace can overpower what they're living in and walking in, no matter what it is, so that they can make it in the Lord. But then he says in verse 5, and listen for all of us and anybody out there listening tonight, uh, especially if we know you and you're around here, it says in here that uh, in everything you are enriched by him. And for all of us, we need to pay attention to that more and more. That word enriched means that we're made wealthy. Everybody got that? Are you awake now? <laughs> Wealth is just waiting to pour down in your chimney and, you know, you go get in your car and it's full of money and all that kind of stuff. It's yeah. not talking about that whatsoever. <laughs> it's talking about wealthy in spiritual things. The spirituals, as some people say spiritual gifts, uh, the knowledge, the understanding that it'll talk about uh, over in verse 30. In everything you are made wealthy by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. And I know some of you have said, and I know you could say it probably now, I was talking to somebody at the mall or talking to somebody at a coffee shop or at a restaurant and it was like the Lord just gave me what to say and filled my mouth. And I said things that I didn't really know if I should say, but they responded to that. And it was exactly where they are because he enriches our speech. 
He makes our speech wealthy in that sense of the spiritual things of the spirit man and the word of God, which is spirit, reaching the soul and spirit of a man to bring them out of where they are. So he says, you're enriched in all utterance and in all knowledge. You know, if you say, I know how the earth came into being, do you know that's knowledge that a lot of people don't have? They still don't have it. They've debated it. They've researched it scientifically, experimented with things, whatever, and they still don't know. And all we have to do is turn to the beginning of our Bible and say, I understand that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God in John 1, right? So that's uh, knowledge that most men don't possess. But he says he makes us wealthy in our speech and in our knowledge. But then again, if we go over to verse 30, uh, let's see. And down into chapter 2, verse 1 there, he says it's not the wisdom of the world that he's talking about. He said, I didn't come to you with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Above that, in the end of chapter 1, he says uh, he uses the base things so that no flesh can glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus. He's the one that has given us the speech and the utterance and the knowledge and what we possess. Of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness, not only knowledge and wisdom, but righteousness. Remember, you and I didn't clean ourselves up. He did that. That's the power of the grace of God working in our lives and the power of this gospel. Uh, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Look what the Lord has done. That song we always used to sing saying to somebody, look, I didn't clean myself up. God did all this, worked all this in me. So back in uh, verse uh, 7, or 6, excuse me, of chapter 1, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so you're enriched in your utterance and knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ is confirmed in us. The more we testify of Christ, the more of the knowledge and the utterance is placed in us or allowed to flow through us, the utterance of the gospel. So that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of the Lord. The Lord has done all this for us. So as we get closer to the coming of the Lord, you don't have to be left behind, the old movie left behind, but you don't have to be left behind in the knowledge and the utterance of the gospel either. And uh, the gifts. Um, of course, when we talk about operating in the gifts, we want to know who's around us. We want to know where they're coming from. We want to know a little bit of their background, what they're really about, who they're in league with. Because so many times there's been folks that have come in the church and they give an utterance or a prophetic word or some of those things, and it causes division, causes confusion, uh, causes people to question what's going on, and that's not supposed to happen. You may remember uh, we talked to a fellow here the other day, uh, a time in the church when somebody came in, and as I was pulling up in my car, I saw their car because they had a specific license plate, and I turned to my wife and kind of laughed a little bit. And I said, before today's over, we're going to have a prophecy and I'm going to get a book. And so the fellow stood up over there, gave his prophecy, walked right from there. And this was in the beginning of church, walked to the usher in the back, handed him the book and walked out. Wasn't going to stay and be a part of the service because 
he believed he had a word from the Lord. And I said to everybody afterwards, don't worry about what he said. I've already talked to him. I already told him we know this. We know these things. Uh, we're walking in all that. But he was a guy who had, he would get something in his mind and you weren't going to tell him any different. And so he did what he did, walked out and he had no real regard for me or the church or anything. And so I clarified what he said, which is my responsibility to do, because I'm the one who's going to give account for everything you enter into or we let go on in here and so on. So I have to take that serious and watch over everything. So he says, but the, you come behind in no uh, gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord, who shall also confirm you unto the end. You know, the greatest thing in the world is to have people saying stuff to you or about you to where you go to prayer and the Lord just makes it, he confirms you. No, I'm not in any of that. Just like that thing over there. Not in that. I already know. And so you walk in this, and this is where some people are devastated by the fact that you have some confidence about what you do. And of course, in, I think it's in the Psalms, it says those who fear the Lord will have strong confidence. They're not confident in themselves. I'm not confident in me. I'm confident in Christ will back up what we say because it's his word. Just like Sunday morning, people said, wow, I'm glad you did what you did. I needed that, the laying on of hands, just to, just to remind me that I've been set apart, remind me that I'm sanctified in the Lord and I'm for his purpose and everything else, not to be thrown around out here in the world. Or, uh, you know, the scripture says, we're not to be the servants of men. We're the servants of God. And so you think about that. Doesn't mean you don't, do what you're asked to do on your job and employment and things like that, or in your household, you know, husbands and wives and so on. But it means we're not serving men. And so much of what's happening in the church type thing is we're serving people. When the church says, tell us what you want, and that's what we'll do, we're serving men. We're not serving God. We're supposed to be asking God, what do you want? How do you want the church to continue to fare? Um, I think next Wednesday we're going to show a video of a young lady who, a uh, pretty good little teaching she did, where she's, uh, and some other folks have done this, but it's not as kind of easy to uh, digest, I guess. She does the church back in the days of the disciples, some of the people talking to some of the people now that are in the church and their viewpoints on things and how they walk with the Lord and how different it is from then till now. And so when you think about that, we have to look at how far off are we? And, you know, we had people in church here that would get mad at me for saying that. Well, listen, because we have a retreat, we're not spiritual. How many times our pastor back then, which, of course, went home to be with the Lord, but how many times he would say, watch, in two weeks they'll be back doing exactly what they did before. Two weeks, there they go. Three weeks, that's it. And they're back doing the same thing. They were spiritual for a moment while you're away three days. Like some of the guys that the guys go minister to and so on, they're in there. And they're good for a while, but when they get out, now they're being tempted again. Now they're in the warfare. Now they're in under the spirit of we can do whatever we want. And they go awry. We pray that they don't, but so many of them do. Because there's nothing, they're not captive anymore. They've got freedom. And if you think about all of us as Americans, we have so much freedom and so much liberty that we don't even understand we're using it all for the flesh. And he told us not to use it for the flesh. So the Lord will confirm you unto the end. How many different scriptures does the Bible give us where God says, I'm going to keep you till the end? Jesus said, I'm with you to the end of the age. Uh, I'll uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. You go on and on through so many things, uh, even when he talks about taking us through the water and the fires won't burn us and everything else. And you look at what he says. He says he'll confirm us to the end. We've got to stay clean. 
We've got to stay right with God. We've got to stay humble and meek as worshipers of the Lord. I was talking to one pastor, and I said, you know, here we go. I'm hearing all this stuff again. You did this, you did that. And he says, yeah, I went through that a little bit ago myself and so on. And I said, well, talking about it, I just said, well, I'm dead. So what's the difference? That's what we learned a long time ago, right, in the gospel. Uh, Jesus said, take up your cross. That means I'm dead. And so say whatever you say. The Lord will confirm you till the end. That means all this stuff, like where do you get these things and how do you conjure, did I say that word right, conjure, conjure up all this stuff because you go to your kettle and you start stirring and you throw in a little bat wing and a little, little bit of hair of a duck and different things and all of a sudden you come up with a whole bunch of things to try to make somebody look bad who also shall confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus. Man, remember the accuser of the brethren is going to be cast down? You remember that? The one who accuses day and night? The one who went before the Lord even back there in the scriptures and, and he says, where are you coming from? I've gone to and fro in the earth and about Job and so on. And he says, you know, have you tried my servant Job? Uh, think about that. He says we're going to be uh, confirmed unto the end and blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes. And that's all because of the blood. That's all because of the grace of God. God is faithful by whom you were called under the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. He's going to confirm us to the end. We're going to be blameless in the day of the Lord. And God is faithful. He's the one who called us and uh, into the fellowship of his son. So he's going to keep us in that fellowship if we keep following. You know, so many people today are teaching that no matter what you do from this point on, God's going to keep you in there and, you know, you're, you never can fall or you know, any of those type of things. Well, why did he say the righteous will fall seven times and the Lord will pick them up? How about the guy that's out there living in sin? Knows the truth or was walking in the truth, accepted Christ, but now he's not walking in righteousness. Uh, what about him? We don't know for sure. I wouldn't want to run the risk. If somebody told me, well, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Listen, it's no different than if somebody breaks in my house and they tell me you don't have to have any protection. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Well, I would rather have protection than go to meet the Lord right now. I mean, I wouldn't mind meeting the Lord right now, but, uh, you know, there's other things to do. So let's go over back there to uh, verse 29. Verse 29. And again, well, 28 also, he said he's chosen the base things of this world. Uh, things that are despised, God has chosen. Things that are not to bring about uh, or bring to naught the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Now listen, I hope you're really praying about a lot of things right now. Praying about souls uh, because calamities seem to be everywhere. Uh, with what they're doing in all these things or allowing in food and everything else, that can be a calamity. Uh, what they're talking about, projections in the next six years, uh, all these things, uh, they're very troubling. A lot of people don't know anything about them, so they're going on as though, well, we're just going to live life. We're going to keep partying and enjoying. I think the Bible says something about the servant um, who said, my Lord delays his coming. Well, you know, Jesus isn't really coming back. And if he does, it's going to be ages and ages from now. Why? They said that, you know, he's going to come way back 60 AD and, and still they're saying it now and he's never shown up yet. But the thing is that you're going to die. And when you die and take your last breath, then you're going to be going to a place of judgment, whether you're with the Lord or not with the Lord. And so you need to be prepared now because whether Jesus comes back or not in the next 
30 or 40 years, you're going to be dead by then, right? So you've got to make a decision now and say, hey, whether he comes later or sooner, it's not going to matter if I'm already passed and I've blown my life on all this stuff in the flesh. So no, sh no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are you in Christ Jesus, and I know I read this already, whom of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. And so what does Paul follow up with? He says, and brethren, when he's talking to the Corinthians, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. It wasn't my putting the words together and my laying it out in a sequence and saying it has to be like this because this is what, uh, you know, people would like to hear or want to hear. He says, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. If we stop preaching Jesus Christ crucified, we're already out of the will of God. That's what Paul preached, and that's what we're to preach. I determine not to know anything among you except for Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's our way to the kingdom. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, which is totally contrary to the wisdom of the world. Why aren't you you know, just so set that everything's going to be fine and deliver what you have and, you know, don't worry about a thing except Paul is saying fear and trembling and weakness. Weakness because if it's not the Lord, it has no life in it. If the Holy Spirit's not backing it up and moving through it, it's not going to touch people's hearts and change them. And you know what? What about when they get angry and decide they want to stone me? because I've offended them by preaching Christ crucified, that you have to die to live, right? So I was with you in much weakness and fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words. Come to Jesus, you'll be wealthy, like everybody jumped up out of their seats when I said that earlier. Uh, you'll be wealthy, or, you know, anything you want in life, God will do it for you. Well, that's not true because he knows the end result of everything you want. And he also knows why you want it and what you plan to do with it because he's all knowing. And so you look at what he says here. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. I wasn't trying to plant something in your mind like sales that you got to buy my book. Because if you read my book, you'll know where all the wisdom is. No, the wisdom is in his book, the Bible, the scriptures. You might have gotten some enlightenment that you can share. But if it's really of God, why don't you just give it out freely like Paul did, like the men of God did? Jesus himself, the Son of God, God in the flesh, said, whatever the Father has given me, paraphrased, I've given it to you. I've held back nothing. Paul said the same thing. So my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And you all know I've said numerous times, I've watched men manipulate people to where all of a sudden the people were submissive to them, but it was by the use of like a force or like uh, almost having something over you, and that's not godly whatsoever. Or, you know, I'll, I'll pummel you if you don't do this or do that. The Bible says that the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. So that is not change in a man's heart. But when the word is delivered 
And the Spirit of the Lord moves with his word. And the Spirit of the Lord touches the spirit of that man. And suddenly that man wakes up and goes, like I said, uh, Sunday morning. Maybe Monday morning some of you would wake up and say, you know what? What have I been doing? I'm set apart for God. I'm sanctified for the Lord. I'm to be doing his will and his bidding. And I'm doing all this other stuff. What, is, what am I caught up in? When did this happen? What do I need to do to go back to? Like, yeah, I have a job to work. That's fine. I have a family. That's fine. But I'm set apart for the Lord, for his work. So my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. Did I tell you Sunday morning I wasn't going to say anything to you except lay hands on you and confess what we talked about, being sanctified, consecrated, and so on, uh, set apart, and that's between you and God. And yes, it's always good if you say, well, listen, pastor, here's what I'm thinking. Uh, it's like when I say about marriage counseling, and you know, before, I've said so many times, before you get in too deep, talk, <coughs> and so on. We've had people that come to me and say, well, and I say, well, I can't do much now. You've already committed to all this, you know? Uh, what about marriage counseling when we had a couple here? I said, well, did you guys, uh, anything about marriage counseling? Because some pastors are saying nobody even wants to do marriage counseling anymore. So what do you do? We're supposed to try to help people make it all the way through everything they do along these lines. So the demonstration of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. It's not about the delivery. It's not about how loud you get. Or it's not about how forceful it is said. It's about what it says right here. The demonstration of the spirit and power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I shared with you a while back again about the fellow I prayed with at one of our events down at the courthouse there. And he just said, oh, thanks, and he walked away. And then he came back later and said, I don't know what you did to me, but, and I said, well, praise God. You know, I prayed salvation with him. I kind of pushed him a little bit. Uh, because his wife was a believer. She'd been praying for him. And so I pushed a little bit, and he said, okay. And I knew this guy from way back. He'd been in prison. Uh, but he came back, and I know it was at least a half hour or so later, and I'm not saying I'm the only one that does this, but I was blessed because that was the power of God. He was changed. So it wasn't by any... Manipulation in a sense or, you know, cunning words or that type of stuff. It was the power of God because when he walked away, he didn't think anything was different. But when he came back, something was different. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And he says, we speak in verse 6, wisdom among them that are perfect. Now, of course, the word perfect here doesn't mean uh, that you totally ascended and you've made it to the end and all that kind of stuff you're being perfected you've been cleansed it means you're right standing and so on uh, for the lord Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect are there certain things that are just for the church yes yes yes, yes. yes. i know i can kind of <laughs> throw you off there uh because we speak the wisdom of God. And so in the gathering of the church, usually there aren't many unbelievers anyway. So we talk about things based on the word of God freely. Those are things that the world and the unsaved won't understand because they still have a carnal mind. And you and I are to have the mind of Christ, right? We have the spirit, they have another spirit, the Bible says, which is the spirit of the flesh. So they aren't like us, they're totally different than us, and that's why they don't understand 
it says in uh, Corinthians, I think it might even be further in this scripture. Yeah, it's down further in verse 2 here. Uh, Howbeit we speak, in verse 6 we are, among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. So the princes of this world are talking about what they're going to accomplish and what they're going to do and how they're going to build kingdoms and everything else. But he says, those are things they talk about that are going to come to naught. But you and I aren't talking about that. We're talking about a kingdom without end and a king who reigns forever and ever and ever. So we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. So the world out there won't understand what we're talking about. It's for us in the church. It's for the body of Christ. It's for the saints. So we speak uh, the wisdom of God in a mystery in verse 7. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. This wisdom that we talk about is the wisdom of God. That listen, if you let go, you receive. If you give you're blessed. If you forgive those that do you evil, God will make sure you're blessed in that. And the world doesn't understand that. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over shall men give unto your bosom. Give love, give appreciation, give respect, give in givings and alms and everything else. He says he'll cause men to give to you in everything that you need. So we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. And it says here, which none of the princes of this world, and some say the principalities that rule in the world, some say it is the governors and the kings and the presidents and so on of the world, which none of them knew, for had they known it, talking back there with Pilate and Herod and the Sanhedrin and so on, had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Man cannot understand what God has prepared for us that love God. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, because we have the spirit. And we're not of the world. We're not the spirit of the flesh and of the world. God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God goes on to say what man knows the things of a man save the spirit and so on. So the spirit of the Lord, you may say, well, I don't feel like I've had revelation of all that. But what you do know, the spirit of the Lord has made known to you through the preaching and the teaching, through the uh, application of the word of God, through uh, the fact that you've accepted Christ, you've been baptized in water, you've been filled with the Spirit. So the Spirit is making all these things known in us. We don't have all the details to the very end, but if you remember a few months back, I mentioned the scripture there where it says that uh, God has made it that way so that we won't know all things. Because what happens when you know all things? Knowledge puffs up. Like a lot of people who now they're telling us exactly what heaven is like because they've been there. They're telling us exactly what hell's like because they say they've been there. Well, then, if you've already been to heaven, what do you need to go back for? You've already had the experience. And you think about hell. Well, you say you went to hell. Well, the Bible says about the gulf betwixt the two. How did you come back? You violated what Jesus taught in the scripture, that the gap is so big that no one can go across one way and across the other way. Does that all make sense? Yes. Talking about, uh, hey, yeah. are we done? No, <laughs> we're, we're not done. I'm going to go just a couple more minutes here. Uh, do you ever think about this? And I mentioned this a while back because there's more and more videos coming out now 
about this was the true body of Jesus and the true blood of Jesus that they ate and drank. You know Jesus was still alive, right? Yes. He hadn't died yet. And he said he's going to drink that cup with them or with us in heaven. I don't know about us drinking a cup of blood in heaven. Because that's what's got to happen, right? If that was really made into the body, flesh, and blood of Jesus, first of all, you had to cannibalize him while he was alive. Because he was standing right there with you. And then he's going to have to drink it again, and so are we, in the kingdom. I don't see that written anywhere. Right? But you will see, is it Jonathan Rumi from The Chosen? Got a lot of videos on this stuff. Pushing it big time because they inserted him into everybody's life through a movie. We're going to plant something in your thoughts. We're going to plant something in your visual. And all these folks are watching The Chosen like it is the gospel. And it's nowhere close. And even the guy tells you, we've, we've fabricated 90-some percent of this. It's not scriptural. But people, like I told you, Joy Behar said, now that's a Jesus we can all love. Because that's a Jesus we can all love. But Jesus said, we aren't all going to love him. He said, I've, I'm hated, you'll be hated. But if you'll just say the chosen is the gospel, we'll love you. We'll accept you. And walk like Jonathan walks and talk like he talks. And why, we'll just be fine with you. And nobody wants to research a lot of the things. Listen, doesn't the Bible say that if the root is holy, the whole thing is holy? If the root is evil, how did it get holy all of a sudden? We're only made holy. We were evil and wicked. How did we get holy? We were engrafted into the tree. The gospel, the Jews, the salvation, all of that. We're trying to say things just, wait a minute, hocus pocus, they all became holy. That's what part of the Catholic terminology is there that's why the kids would go out and say hocus pocus and they're trying to make something into something so hocus pocus all of a sudden this was totally evil now it's a blessing it's wonderful amen, amen. think about it and if we don't think we're going to be in trouble because we have the spirit the holy spirit will bring things like this to mind and it's like you've got to say, wait a minute, how can that be? It's nowhere in the gospel. Why are people teaching it? Why is everybody following it? Why are we saying that when you do occult practices, you're my brother? Because if you're doing occult practices, you're not our brethren. Uh, Joni Lamb, there's some videos, they say that she was talking to her dead husband. Uh, now, you know, talking up there or something or saying hey you know whatever I don't know that that goes all that way but if you're saying he communicated back with you you've entered into something because that's forbidden that's necromancy and so it doesn't mean you're not still a believer but you've entered into something you better renounce it whether that's true or not I don't know I'm not claiming that I know it I'm just saying there's some videos out there that are, people are saying that uh, you can probably look it up like you can look a lot of things up. Uh, you can ask Alexa. How many of you saw that Alexa knew the damage that was being done by Hurricane Milton and it hasn't even hit the island, hit, hit the land yet, just hitting right now? Somehow she already knew what was going to happen and where it was going to be done. Is that strange? No, it's not. It's not strange at all. Just like I said, when you ask, is Peter the Pope uh, of the Catholic Church in the beginning? And it says, Catholic tradition says. Nothing strange. 
Do we trust the wisdom of the world? Because one day this thing is going to speak and everybody's going to go hail and that's going to be the great deception. Amen? And there's going to be some people that will know nothing about it whatsoever that you thought were brethren and they're going to be deceived by it all. So set apart, sanctified for this call and this cause and a lot of people like to say when things are going wonderful, well, for this hour I came into the kingdom. But wait a minute, Esther's life was being threatened at the time. You're, you're sitting on high ground. That's not where she was at. Because if you don't do this, don't think that you will escape the wrath of the king. Nobody's talking about that. But if I don't obey what the Lord says, I could die in this. No, but for such a time as this, I've been brought into the kingdom. Well, listen, so if we're obeying the Lord, that can come to pass in our lives. Amen? Amen. So Sunday, we prayed about consecration, sanctification, and what was the other word? There was one other, sanctification, consecration. Uh, okay, well, anyway. You're supposed to remember something. I'm only asking you to remember one word <laughs> that I'm not thinking of. Father, we thank you for this night. Give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. And Lord, I just pray this word, just let it saturate us. Uh, Father, somebody may say, well, you all go too far with it. No, uh, we're going all the way in Christ is what we're doing. Uh, we're consecrating ourselves, being set apart and have been set apart for this. And we thank you for that tonight, give you all the praise. Just pray you bless anybody out there that listened tonight. And listen, if you're out there listening and you're not a believer in Jesus, you're not going to understand a lot of this. And I will tell you that right now. But if you will, uh, you can contact us. I'll be glad to take you to some of the basics of the gospel so that you can understand. The first thing is that Christ becomes Lord of your life because he comes into us and quickens our spirit man, which is dead. If you don't know Jesus, that spirit part of you isn't alive to understand all these things. But when he makes you alive, when he quickens you, then you begin to understand spiritual things. And that's the only reason we're talking what we talk, because he did it for us. But he'll do it for you if you will yield to him also. Okay? So God bless. And if you'd like to contact, put something on the uh, comments there or... You know, like the video, whatever. I don't say that very often. I'm lo not looking for sponsorship or uh, money returns or getting out all over the place. Not worried about that at all. I'm concerned about helping people find Christ and know Christ and be saved from all the stuff that's going to come in the end. God bless. All right. Anybody, any questions? Anybody?